Hello and welcome to Keep It Science. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Kugler, a biomedical image analyst, science communicator, and director of Zeeks. And I am Nick Gorn, a scientist, marketer, and CEO of Acorn Scientific Marketing. And today we're both in the booth to host Keep It Science episode, Keep It Organized. Um, have you ever thought yourself wishing for more time, a streamlined process, or simplified delegation to ensure a successful company? Well, you're in the right place. In today's discussion, we'll uncover strategies to save time, stay on top of essential processes and make a streamlining a breeze. Yes, so if you're ready to level up your project management game, stay tuned. This episode is tailor-made for you. Today, we will be talking about project management and how to scale with system. Our guest today is Dr. Tulio Rossi, the director of Animate Your Science, a science communication trainer and AMP tomorrow maker and named 40 Under 40. So Tulio, thank you for joining us today. Um, could you start by maybe introducing yourself to our listeners with a few words? Hi everyone, great to be here and thank you for the invite. Um, so you, you already introduced me extremely well, I don't know if I can top that, but yeah, essentially seven years ago uh, when I finished my PhD and I noticed that science has this massive communication problem, I decided to put my skills to good use and started offering a service. So what happened is that I, I started making videos about my own PhD research and that worked really well, uh, talking about animated videos. And I noticed that lots of researchers around me liked what I did and they told me that they would have liked to do the same, but they didn't have the time or they didn't know how to do it. So I put my skills to good use and started helping them. And so bit by bit, I built a business. And today um, we're very uh, lucky to be trusted by researchers and institutions from literally all over the world. We're one of the few companies that can say we have clients in every single continent, including Antarctica. That is well impressive. Um, Antarctica, who is there? That? That's great. <laughs> Uh, it is the Australian Antarctic Division. That's so we, yeah, it's a government agency and they, they take care of research there in Antarctica. We made a number of um, isometric illustrations to show, for example, how they are doing this incredible endeavor, which is to get the, the deepest ice core in the world. Uh, they need to go to the center of Antarctica with like a train of vehicles and then drill uh, the, the deepest uh, that humans have ever drilled in the ice and to, to basically reconstruct our past climate history like it's never been done before. So a really, really cool project. Very, very amazed every time we, we have to deal with such interesting research. It really makes working a pleasure. I think that's the thing when you work in science communication, the people that you work with, it's always great that you learn from them, right? But now that we heard from you a little bit like about who you are maybe you can tell us a bit about your company structure and who else is working with you yeah so early on i made the decision not to be a freelancer uh, and so i probably what helped me to make that decision was joining a, a startup hub where i started having business mentors and they 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 challenged me and said yeah this sounds great but it's just a glorified job for yourself. This is not a business. Uh, <laughs> that initially threw me off a bit, but then uh, I saw that they had a point. You know, it, there's nothing wrong with being a freelancer, but um, if you want to build something a bit bigger than yourself and have therefore an impact bigger than you'll ever be able to achieve by yourself, you need to build a team. And so I started literally from nothing with no money. So the beginning was me and two interns. And then when I could afford, I hired an employee half uh, part-time and then full-time. And then a second, a little third. And uh, the biggest we've ever been was five full-time employees. Now we're down to four. Um, but the, yeah, the plans is to grow probably to double the size, maybe around 10 people. And I think I will be happy with that. At, at least at, at this stage, I don't, I don't think I will want a bigger team because also managing people comes with its own set of challenges uh, and people's problems become your problems as the business owner business owner so yeah it, it's um it's not for everyone i would say yeah uh, definitely there's there are some people i know 
that um, tried to start the business. They uh, built a team and then they went back to being freelancers because they got so tired of people. <laughs> so some days I feel like that. <laughs> uh, but I think uh, most of the time, it, the upsides of having a team uh, were worth it. Yeah, I think it's definitely a challenge, right? And I think, for example, for me, coming from academia into industry, I mean, I'm nowhere near where you're at, right? But for me, I think the main thing at the start, so in the kind of first year, was really to to be overwhelmed a lot with like all the accounting and law and processes. And you mentioned business mentors. So maybe you could talk a little bit more about, you know, business mentors and any kind of business training that you have received and why that was important for you to really shape your company. Yeah, look, that I would say probably the number one reason why we've been successful is that I, I kept learning because, you know, PhD prepares you for many things, but <laughs> running a business is not one of them. Um, so, I, you know, PhD gives you some great transferable skills, uh, like the, the grit, the capacity to be comfortable being out of your comfort zone, figuring things out on your own, um, trial and error, you know, the basic, basically the, you can apply the scientific method, method also to a business. Uh, you know, you don't know how to do marketing. You don't know which marketing technique is going to work for your audience. So you just need to do trial and error. So it's just a series of experiments. That, that's how I like to see it, uh, how, I, how I like to look at it. So, um, sorry, I got a bit lost. Uh, oh, yeah, mentors. Um, yeah, so I was lucky to join to be accepted in this startup hub inside the university where I did my PhD. And from the early, early days, I had access to some great mentors with a lot of business experience. For example, it was an excellent one uh, that was a digital marketer. And he, he looked at my website and took it to shreds. <laughs> but it was useful because back then I had no clue what I was doing. I was just a newbie. And so I needed somebody to tell me, Tulio, that's rubbish. You need to do it that way. Um, and I learned. And he then gave me the pointer to start a blog, which was great because over time, that blog is what uh, brought us to top three uh, search results on Google for several of our, of our most important keywords. If it wasn't for that mentor, probably I would have come across that lesson you know, years later. So having a mentor is definitely very important. And the startup hub, I felt that the mentors I could get got me to a certain point. Then I was still hungry for more. So then I joined uh, a business school, which is not a university, not an academic business school. It's a privately run business uh, where you have a business coach and they're, they're run their own programs. And each one is different, but... Uh, I joined one first and then I found another one that I liked even more and I've been there with them since. So I've been now, I'm in my fifth year of membership with them. And that means spending a, a significant amount of money on this is like doing a master degree again, um, but it's all worth it. Uh, and it's tax deductible, right? Because it's, it's your business education. So it's a, it's a tax deduction, but it, it's money well spent and it, it keeps me up to date and it's also another thing you, you might already have come across uh, in your journey is that running a business can get a bit lonely. You know, when, when you're an employee, you, you can uh, make friends and hang out with other employees. When you're the boss, it's a bit different and it ends up being a bit lonely. And so it's great to go to these sort of events where you find other business owners like you that think like you. And so you can then, you know, exchange experiences and, and stories and, and whatnot. I think it's it's another very important aspect of these beast school is the community. Yeah, the the loneliness of a CEO is definitely <laughs> it's definitely something that I think both myself and Elizabeth have experienced, but we found each other quite early on in our company's journeys and it's been, you know, a bit of a godsend because we've been able to sort of mentor each other and listen and learn from each other as well. Um you, you mentioned early on uh, adding members to your team. So, what did you what did you look for in the beginning? What kind of mindset were you looking at for your your early employees to to grow? I realized that you know if I want to grow a business, I need to work on the business, not in the business. That that's a, a key uh, difference to to understand. 
And so I, I started um, by looking at uh, creatives that were better than me uh, at their trade. And so animators and illustrators, and I put them to work. And I was then managing the projects and, and playing the science communicator role. And once that was in place, I then hired the first science communicator. And as a rule for my company, I decided that all the science communicators need to have a PhD. Uh, doesn't mean that if you don't have a PhD, you cannot be a science communicator. Don't get me wrong. That's not what I'm saying. It's just that it's a choice for my company is what makes us unique. Otherwise, there's a million animation studios out there, but there's only hours that where we can say you're dealing with a team of uh, PhD trained science communicators. So it's a, it's a branding choice and we work a lot with researchers and so on. It's a way to make them feel in good hands uh, because that doctor title comes with a package of assumptions, which is typically a good one. Yeah. So yeah, that that's that's how I went about uh, at it, and yeah, still that's the structure. So we basically put PhD trained science communicators working side by side with creatives, so animators and illustrators, and this way nobody's getting lost in translation. Uh, the animators do what they're best at without freaking out about the science they don't understand. And, and the science communicator is there to to bridge the, the two worlds. Yeah, so the communication between the two in a scientific communication company, is uh, it's it's essential, isn't it? Um, but obviously, uh, you know, growth in a company like yours doesn't happen overnight. Uh, could you talk to us a little about what your what your initial company vision was was, and how it's changed over the past few years, and as well as that, where you see it going in the next five years. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you're, you're right, it doesn't happen overnight, for sure. In fact, the, the first year and a half, I mean, zero money. I was just as poor as a PhD student. Uh, <laughs> so basically, my, my lifestyle didn't really change from, from poor PhD student, I became a poor startup owner at least for the first year and a half, two years. Uh, then things started to get better. Uh, so for every business, you need to give it time. Roughly a year and a half to two years, you need to give it time to, to gain momentum. And my initial vision was all about uh, video abstracts and graphical abstracts. Um, I, I love the concept and I thought one day they will be the, the norm, just like it is today the norm to have a written abstract with your paper. So seven years later, unfortunately, that vision hasn't realized yet. Um, and the company changed a bit because then what I found is that what our bread and butter are not the video abstracts, but the more customized and tailored animations that are not about an individual paper. So could be anything, could be an, an explainer for government new research project. It could be an explainer for a biotech company, you know, you name it, all sorts of different topics and types of messages and audiences. Um, but yeah, this is something I, I didn't picture at the beginning, um, but it was a welcome thing in the end because these custom uh, animations also were found customers that wanted a higher production value product, something that often researchers cannot afford. Uh, so we started offering that higher production value as well, uh, which was not part of my initial vision. I, initially, I was just trying to make things as affordably as possible for researchers. But then we found there was also another market there or, um, that was, you know, had more means to, to pay for nicer videos. Uh, so why not making them? So in the end, I realized that um, instead of volume, what was more rewarding was to produce quality videos we can be proud of uh, when we look back at them. So yeah, we, we basically, the initial vision was doing lots of video abstracts and as affordable as possible, then it became, let's do way less volume, but better quality videos that don't necessarily need to be about an individual research paper. I love that you talk about this change of vision, right? Because I think when we start companies, we always kind of start off with a vision but things change and especially change, as you mentioned, with when you know the market and you start to see your customers and the interest. So your vision changed very much from like video abstracts to bespoke animations. And 
I would love to hear a little bit more about, you know, were there any other struggles that you really thought, you know, that changed for you the way you run your company and what led to success for you? Yeah, so something that comes to mind is that, of course, when, when you start a service uh, agency like mine, uh, <laughs> clients are few and far between. And so it, it was literally really hard to, to sustain myself in the first year. And so something that uh, I started doing to uh, help myself was to also teach. And so I started offering trainings and workshops uh, in universities and um, University of Adelaide, for example, where I did my PhD, uh, hired me. Uh, and then I got really lucky when um, <laughs> this crazy story, basically I, I presented the success story of my first video at a scientific conference and somebody, um, this guy, an Australian researcher working in Hong Kong, saw it and he told me, oh, I'm organizing this conference in China. I would love to you to give the same presentation there as an invited speaker. I said, like, bring it on. First time ever to, for me to be an invited speaker talking about science communication. Fantastic. I went to China and then in China, I met this other person we would love to work my presentation and say, hey, Tulio, would you like to stay here in China longer and teach a whole course to undergrads and graduate students? I'm like, well, say what? <laughs> a course? Like, honestly, I had content for two, three hours back then, and they were asking me to teach a course that will last five weeks. But you know what you do in those moments? You say yes, and you figure out later how to do it. And so, and so I said, okay, uh, sure, I would love to. And so they started preparing uh, that content, which was an amazing opportunity uh, because they actually paid me pretty well uh, to do that work uh, in China. And they basically that, that helped me put bread on the table and gave me time to really prepare that content that I'm still using today in my workshops and online courses. That really was the foundation of it all. And so it was an amazing opportunity also, what a great opportunity to go and experience a country like China from the inside for an extended period of time. You know, five weeks was perfect uh, to get a feeling for the country and the people and the culture a bit better, much better than you can on a holiday. Um, so it was a fantastic experience. And so basically, yeah, the challenge of, you know, not having, not relying on one income stream was to was overcome by having two the training and the service provider. And then for the past seven years, the train, sorry, the, the service providing uh, has been the, the main source of income. In the future, I'm actually, I would like that to, to change uh, because I see lots of potential in, in training in the future. Um, so yeah, it's part of the constant evolution of, of the business and its vision with time. Fascinating stuff. And I feel like Elizabeth and I have somewhat similar stories to this with uh you know doing things cost effectively but high quality for, for academia and spin out companies in the early days um so yeah i really can relate to everything that you're putting out there um we're going to take a 30 second break and here's a brief word from one of our friends and sponsors hi fancy folks welcome to luxi where we make science fun approachable, and most of all, fancy. I'm Dr. Lex, former microbiologist, current global health consultant, and enthusiast of all the finer things in life. I'm often joined here by my husband, electrical engineer, inventor, and our audio engineer, Dr. Demos. In this podcast, we take listeners on a journey into the microscopic worlds of luxury items and unravel the fascinating intersection of science and opulence. From how bubbles form in champagne to the molecular forces that harden clay in a kiln, to the amount of thrust needed to send a rocket to space. No luxurious topic is safe from our insatiable curiosity. We're on a mission to demystify science and show how it drives the world around us. No PhD or lab coat required. So if you've ever wondered how science and luxury seamlessly intertwine, join us as we uncover untold stories, hidden marvels, and the inner workings of scientific discovery and sophistication. Along the way, we'll also chat with 
with amazing scientists and artisans. So subscribe now and let the exploration begin. Welcome back. Today we're talking to Tulio Rossi on the subject of project management and general organization for scientists. Uh, I wanted to start off the second chunk of this podcast by talking about the most valuable thing um, a software can offer us, and that's saving the user a lot of time. Um, for project management, customer management, social media managing, and scheduling, all of these things, as well as tons of strategy and communication within your team, there's loads of different software that is employed to ensure that we can focus on what really matters. And something you said earlier was you wanted to work on the business, less in the business. Um, so could you talk to us a little about what and or how you employ different methods to ensure that you're as efficient as possible? Of course. So product management uh, has been a bit of an obsession of mine. Um, I think I tried way too many platforms and, until I settled on one that I love. And the uh, you know, to cut it short, essentially, there's lots on the market like Asana, Trello, and blah, 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 blah. There's a million project management softwares out there for you to choose from. But the, the problem they all share is that these companies develop these systems approximating the stereotypical business needs. And so their functionalities work for most um but rarely, they, they rarely fit you like a glove. So in the end, I found this other platform a couple of years ago called Notion, which instead has a different uh, starting point. Notion at the beginning is not user friendly at all because it is like Photoshop. It lets you do a million different things and you, you really need to start it first before you can make any meaningful use of it. Um, but then the great thing is they let you develop your own system for your unique needs. And, and that is amazing. Also, it's way more affordable than most uh, other project management systems out there that I know. So what is Notion? It's basically, uh, it's like if uh, Evernote and databases had a baby. And so you, it's uh, some people see it as a note-taking app, but honestly, it's a lot more than that. It, you can run a whole business with that because of the databases, functionalities, and automation, very advanced features that it offers. Uh, you can, you know, assign tasks, you can follow projects, you can view things as a table, as a Kanban board, as a calendar, as, as a gun chart, you know, there's a million functionalities and everything can be customized to your need. And either you, you buy the, the a template or get one for free from the internet. There's millions of there are there. There are people that literally make a living selling uh, Notion templates, or you can build yours for free. And so, what I did is to uh, take a, a, an online course in Notion uh, from a Notion geek, uh, and even somebody like me with zero coding experience. I uh, was able to then put together the whole system that runs my company, essentially all the project management, tracking on everything, tracking of our, uh, you know, the, the clients, the institutions, uh, the projects, the uh, strategy calls, the, the kickoff meetings, uh, organizing those notes and uh, tracking our testimonials, uh, reviews, you name it. Everything is in there, literally. If Notion went down, we will be screwed. <laughs> we're, we're, we're in attendance on it these days. Uh, you mentioned social media. Yes, you can build your social media calendar in it and attach your creative assets. You know, if you need to post a picture, you can also at do create attachments in, in Notion and it can store a, a lot of data or even videos. You can attach all sorts of uh, files. And um, Notion lets you communicate really well um, with your team, and even with your clients, if you use it as a client portal like we do. So basically, there's multiple users can have access to the same thing, like in a Google Doc. So multiple people come in, they see the same draft. Let's say we're reviewing a script for a video. Uh, we have an internal review before it goes out to the client, then it goes to the client, 
they log in into Notion themselves with their account, they make the comments, they make the changes, everything is in one place. So there's no sending of a Word file version one, uh, and then we get to version 17, and it gets lost, uh, you know, all those problems are gone because it's all in one place. So it, it can sound a bit like a Google Doc, but trust me, it's a, it, it's a lot more. Uh, it's all more powerful than that because everything is in one place. And also the, the other thing I love about it, since I, I got into it, I read a book uh, called uh, Building a Second Brain, which is basically a, a framework to create uh, basically your, your personal notes for everything you, you read or learn, um, just about anything in your personal life. Well, notion that that whole also has become my second brain uh, outside the business. So things like uh, tradesmen that need to, that we need to you know hire for you know the plumbing job or bricklaying job. You know it's there. You know um, travel plans, uh, receipts, you name it. Everything that you want to store. That there's an amazing power in putting it all in one place and being easily searchable. So the, the search functionality w- was amazing before. Now in the last month or two, they added AI to it. It's just next level. So you just need to tell it, oh, find me that um, travel. Um, re- you know, I did some research for my travel to Colombia. I, I can't find the, the Notion page. Can you find it for me? And then the AI will go on and it's like, okay, look everywhere. has access to all your notes that you have written. We'll find it and give you the answer. So it's quite quite something, really. Yeah, I know Elizabeth is always on the hunt for new software for organization and everything. So she'll be Googling pricing structures right now, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, man, I was so like laughing when you said if Evernote and databases had a baby, it would be Notion. Because uh, I really feel that. And I think with a lot of software, right, we have this problem, as you mentioned, they all have some positives but most of them are like only 80 percent there like in the last 20 percent that you need to adapt them for your business they're just not there so i will definitely pick your brain afterwards to talk a little bit more about notion but for now i would also like to talk with you a little bit more about you know i think i mean you spoke about a few things already but i think a lot of freelancers who are listening to this i think what they struggle with is this mindset change of a one man band to a large enterprise and agency and i think you touched upon it when you said you had this business meeting and then they said you have a glorified job and not a business at the moment so i would love to to hear a bit more about you know how did you change and what was maybe you can mention two examples that really changed how you went from freelance to agency and especially in your mindset shift what helped you to achieve this i think it was just a very slow and incremental change i I can't think of any one moment um definitely that episode i told you earlier about where this uh business person told me oh man you're just building a glorified job for yourself that definitely hit me uh it made me think a lot um but since then I just accepted that I'm not working in the business anymore. I'm working on the business. And so that means I'm not on the tools. I'm not opening Photoshop. I'm not opening all Illustrator and all the rest. Um, I'm instead the guy chasing customers, uh, working on marketing strategies and social media, blog writing, you know, a million other things that you need to worry about uh, when you have a business. one advantage of a business versus um, a freelance uh, career is that as a freelancer, you still need to do all these other things within your very limited day. You still need to do your marketing somehow. Uh, if you don't have uh, you know clients lining up the door, you still need to do your marketing. Um, at least when you have a business, you can hire people that are dedicated to that and so for example now uh, the next hire we'll make is for a sales and marketing person uh, because you know I'm not the best marketer I've never been it's definitely not my strength uh, and I would love to have somebody that can 
know more about it than me and teach me some techniques and come up with some innovative strategies that I've never thought about. All of that is impossible if you're a one-man show. Um, so it all needs to come out of you. And also, I realized that, you know, it, it's normal for us humans to have our blind spots and weaknesses. And so there's only that far you can go alone. Um, you can definitely go further as a team. And, and it also comes down to your my, you know, mission. Uh, what, what am I trying to achieve with this business? Um, well, I'm trying to empower researchers to have a broader impact, to, to, to really put their research to good use. So it's not just sitting in a, an online repository, getting virtual dust, um, but actually changing the world. And obviously, if I have a team of five or 10 people, I can help a hell of a lot more people than I can help along. It's as simple as that. So that's a key driver. And, you know, it didn't happen overnight. And you, there's a lot of learning to do. Uh, and I'm still learning and I'll never stop learning. Um, it's just gradual. And the, the best analogy that uh, anybody ever told me was that running a business is like uh, piloting a plane. Um, and while you're reading the air, you're, you're figuring, you're, you're reading the manual and figuring out what the different buttons do. <laughs> It is like that, very much so. Yes, uh, I think we've we've had a couple of mayday mayday type moments in our in our podcast lives and our business lives as well. But yes, a lot of learning still to do for for us, and it, it's good to know that other people are still learning as well. Um, could you maybe share a couple? And I know you've mentioned Notion already, which seems like the biggest time hacks that we're going to get out of this. But pro for productivity, <laughs> time hacks. Things like that, so our listeners can pick up um, some of your wisdom and help them stay as organized as you. <laughs> oh, well, I'll, I'll give you one about AI, which is very topical. Uh, so I've never been into writing. Uh, it all goes back to high school when my Italian teacher told me I sucked at writing. <laughs> that really never left me, that, that judgment that never left me. So. For the rest of my life, I believe I, I, I'm not good at writing. So always had a bad relationship with writing. Add to that that English is my second language. is definitely pretty low on my um, favorite things to do. So all of that meant that, you know, writing for me has been a bit of suffering. Um, writing blogs felt like a huge effort. Even writing social media posts, like the, just the simple act of choosing which words to use to communicate a certain idea or felt pretty massive effort, which ultimately limited how much uh, I could post on social media just because it was so draining. And in the, you know, once you get busy, then you procrastinate and you're like, oh, you know, well, I'm, I'll skip that one today. You know, I can tweet tomorrow, whatever. Um, and that, of course, that's no good because being active on social media, it, it is important undeniably um, for a business owner. And so all of that changed when um, ChatGPT came to the scene because all, all of a sudden I had a personal copy editor available to me 24-7 for 20 bucks a month. And that was life-changing for me. So since um, ChatGPT, I am way more active, especially on LinkedIn. I, I now pick LinkedIn as my focus platform. And the results are already coming. I've been, you know, three or four months of LinkedIn where I was posting two, three times a week already resulted in, in some work and an invite on the radio, an invite on a new podcast, and, you know, great exposure and expanding my network, etc. So all of that is because now I just go to ChatGPT and I say, all right, this is what I want to say figure out the exact words <laughs> and then he will write the post and then it will be 80% there. And I just need to do my final tweaks, add a little bit of my own. I, you know, I mean, typically ChatGPT is terrible at the initial hook. So the hook needs to come from you, uh, in my experience. Um, but you know, getting your 80% there in minutes, it's a huge time saver. 
And the result is that I'm now, you know, the, that huge hurdle is, is not there anymore. And I, I'm way more active on social media and I'm reaping the rewards. And when I'm, I need to write something longer than a LinkedIn post, um, I have um, a slightly different method where I mind map it first. So let's say I need to write a blog. I mind map the key ideas uh, because I'm, I'm a visual person. And so seeing it in a mind map works for me. And then looking at that mind map, I record myself uh, explaining that concept like if I was explaining it to you right now on, on this podcast. And then I will copy and paste the transcript of that recording into ChatGPT and ask to act as a copy editor and, and you know, cut all the waffling and trim it down, and you know, but without changing the tone, without changing my voice. So it still feels like me. It's just having a copywriter at your disposal. 24 seven for 20 bucks a month. That is a massive time saver. I absolutely love that. And there's so much I can relate to. Um, also English being my second language, I hated writing um, in the past. I've now fallen in love with it, but I think also a lot has to do with it, with, with chat GTP, as you say, it kind of takes away this initial hurdle of writing. It's almost like an enzyme, right? It kind of takes away the activation energy that you need when you're procrastinating. Mm -hmm. I always feel like, you know, it's just this kind of, you need a little bit of like a seed to start. And then, like you say, you rewrite and you edit it to your own voice and your own message. But what I also really loved, and I think that's one important thing that I, especially in the last few months, starts to appreciate, is that voice recording is so very different to actual writing. And especially when we do science communication, I think voice recording is so much easier to to really distribute core ideas and I think what you mentioned with your mind map that you draw it out for yourself and then you voice record it and then you put it into Jack TTP I think that's a great workflow and like just like especially for people who struggle with writing that might be a huge game changer to change from kind of a blank page to a mind map that's visual and then something voice recorded that you can do on your phone or whatever i think that is really really great um so thank you for that and i think a lot of our guests and, and like listeners will really enjoy that one and we kind of want to wrap up now a little bit because um we have now um spoken with you for almost an hour already and we wanted to ask if there's any kind of favorite science fact or anecdote that you really like to tell or that you know you use for your motivation and anything that comes to mind that really inspires you and your your work that you do sure uh, I, I was looking forward to geeking out about a bit of marine biology stuff oh <laughs> yeah that was that's what i started marine biology um so tell me um have I, I, either of you ever been snorkeling or scuba diving yes love it snorkeling yes, yes. not very good but i have <laughs> okay so Think about when you were out in the water and you find yourself near a reef. Have you ever noticed a crackling sound in the background? Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah, you noticed it, right? I, I also noticed it for the vast majority of my life. I had no clue what what made that sound. And I thought it was uh, pebbles being moved back and forth by the waves, but it's not that. That is the sound produced by snapping shrimp. Snapping shrimp are small. They can be you know, the size of a small coin or up to the size of your index finger maximum. They're extremely common. They live in pretty much all environments, temperate, tropical, and they hide all the time. So they're there, but you never see them. They're always hiding, a bit like ants, right? Um, but they're always there and in great numbers. And the way they communicate is by snapping the claw and making this clicking sound. Not only that, they also use it for hunting because it turns out that the, their claw is just a marvel of evolution. It, it has a plunger and a socket. And when the plunger enters the socket, the water that was in there is shot out at such a speed that it produces a, a cavitation bubble 
that when it implodes on itself, uh, creates this super loud noise, which is second only to the sonar of a sperm whale. So it's the second loudest animal in the world, but is less than the size of your index finger. Working with them in the lab was so much fun. I got to spend so much time with them that I eventually thought they even had personalities. <laughs> so, but maybe I was going a bit too far with them. <laughs> that is, yeah, that is so interesting. And now I know a hell of a lot more about organization, shrimp, and you. So thank you very much, Tulia. That was great. There you go. <laughs> Um, well, there you have it. That was Keep It Organized with Tulio Rossi of Animate Your Science. Thank you for having me. Well, it was great fun to talk to both of you. Oh, you're very welcome. You can learn more about both the man and the company by searching animateyour.science or following Tulio on LinkedIn at Tulio Rossi. We'll also tag him in the link you probably clicked to get to this episode. Uh, Thank you for listening to our episode and hopefully you've learned some strategies to be your best, most productive self and have taken note of some of the useful tips that can help you save time and money. Our next regular episode will be Keep It Open, where we will talk with open science experts on why open science is more important than ever and what challenges open science efforts are facing. But before that, we have a super special, super secret bonus episode. So stay tuned. Ooh, well, if, you, uh, if you'd like to be involved or have any questions for us or future guests, contact us on the platform formerly known as Twitter or LinkedIn at Keep It Science. Or you can email us at keepitscience at gmail.com. And finally, you can listen to more from us on Google, Spotify, Apple or YouTube or wherever you're listening to this right now. Thank you for listening. And see you next time. This episode was supported by Animate Your Science, a research services company for science animations and graphics. Animate Your Science was founded by a scientist for scientists, so they understand your needs. The PhD trained science communicators work side by side with professional designers following a process ensuring scientific rigor. With Animate Your Science, you will get head-turning videos and graphics that truly engage your audience. So, have you ever thought about what would happen if your airline window popped out? Or if you could build a jetpack using only machine guns? (laughs) Turns out you can, but you really, really shouldn't. Hi, I'm Jill Chacha, host of a podcast that's for weird people who like learning about weird stuff. It's called, well, that's interesting. And it's a comedy science show that tells the story behind the facts because those stories are funny. Every Thursday, I tell the tale behind an odd new discovery, like how researchers found two mysterious structures surrounding Earth's core, or how it's actually possible to stop hiccups using a rectal massage. Yes, there's a story behind that. No pun intended. And I tell the story because storytelling is the perfect way to learn and remember. The facts are bizarre, the stories are epic, and the laughter is plentiful. So, join the flock and listen to All That's Interesting wherever you do podcasts.